Donc nous reprenons notre, pour le dernier après-midi. Donc la première, partie de, la première partie de cette session euh, va se tenir euh, en, en anglais. Je ferai malgré tout pour tout le monde les présentations des orateurs en, en français. Nous avons commencé ce matin ce panel sur le vieux monde industriel en écoutant euh, le professeur Emmanuel Doquès. Et maintenant, euh, nous allons entendre trois exposés successivement. Euh, celui de Wilma Liebman, euh, d'Elena Gerasimova et de Nicolas euh, Kuntouris. Alors, euh, Wilma Liebman est professeure adjointe à la New York University School of Law et elle a également enseigné à Cornell, euh, à l'Université de l'Illinois, et à la George Washington University Law School, dont elle est diplômée. Euh, et elle a enseigné le droit du travail. Euh, sa compétence en matière de droit du travail n'est pas seulement universitaire, puisqu'elle a été euh, présidente du National Labor Relations Board. Euh, qui, elle avait été nommée par Barack Obama euh, le 20 janvier 2009 et elle a quitté ses fonctions le 27 août 2011. Euh, le National Labor Relations Board est une pièce maîtresse de, du dispositif du National Labor Relations Act de la période du New Deal qui était vraiment au centre de l'architecture des relations du travail construite pendant la période du euh, New Deal. Uh, I was describing the National Labor Relations Board as an essential piece in the legal uh, framework in the States. So uh, you have the flow for uh, the title of the intervention is the labor questions a century later. Bon après-midi. Je remercie Professeur Supio pour l'opportunité de participer à cette discussion. Je suis honoré. Et maintenant, c'est tout en français. <coughs> Paris in the spring of 1919 is uh, a good starting point for anyone wishing to understand today's world. And so that's where I will start. In May 1919, during the Paris peace negotiations, US President Woodrow Wilson sent a cable to the US Congress from Paris. And I want to read you three sentences from that cable to the Congress. The question which stands at the front of all others amidst the present great awakening is the question of labor. How are the men and women who do the daily labor of the world to obtain progressive improvement in the conditions of their labor to be made happier and to be better served by the communities and the industries which their labor sustains and advances? The object of all reform in this essential matter must be the genuine democratization of industry. Everyone seemed to be talking at the time and seemed to acknowledge that the labor question was not merely the supreme economic question in the United States, but also the essential moral, political, and social dilemma of the new industrial order. A recent history of the Gilded Age describes the core of what was known as the labor question as how to reconcile the democratic promise of the nation with the profoundly undemocratic organization of industry. Industrial democracy had come to be widely regarded as necessary to resolve the labor question, but what industrial meant was ambiguous open for debate, and subject to radically diverse interpretations and experimentation. But by 1919, it seemed that, notwithstanding all these differences of meaning, that industrial democracy was an idea whose time had come, or so it seemed. America's rapid industrialization in the 19th century after the Civil War and technological innovation during the late 19th century had led to a series of periodic depressions, extreme inequality, 
ostentatious wealth alongside wretched living and working conditions, political agitation and massive labor strife, oftentimes very bloody. There were armed confrontations. Immigrants who had come to the country in great numbers were, were rising up in protest. There were general strikes in cities and mass industrial unionism was beginning. The factory system and the technological advance that went with it were viewed as possibly creating the possibility of releasing men and women from drudgery, but also creating new dangers to liberty. And all of this turmoil, in fact, created a period of reform called the Progressive Era in the early 20th century. There was experimentation with industrial democracy, which was a term that started to be used in the late 19th century. But again, what it meant was subject to diverse interpretations and a clash of ideas. Some unions and some political groups championed the idea of worker ownership of factories. The Knights of Labor, the prominent labor organization in the 1880s, uh, promoted the idea of uh, overthrowing the wage labor system uh, and having cooperative ownership of, of production. They sought a cooperative commonwealth. They were the descendants of an older order of republicanism that appealed to independent manhood, citizenship, and the worker as producer. And there were, in fact, lots of experiments with different kinds of worker ownership. Those generally failed over time, however, and ultimately unions were led to pursue collective bargaining between employers and, and independent trade unions. Samuel Gompers, who was president of the American Federation of Labor, the Federation of Craft Unions, promoted the idea of the living wage as a source of uplift and prosperity. In Gomper's view, higher wages would increase consumption, which would stimulate the economy. And higher pay and shorter hours would make working men, working men better. He, Gomper said liberty can be neither exercised nor enjoyed by those who are in poverty. And there was a general shift in, in American unions to wages and consumption rather than the notion of control over work. Employers during this period, for their part, were very eager to slow down the growth of independent, powerful trade unions. And starting in the early years of the 20th century, many employers, big corporations, started to experiment with different kinds of non-union committees in the workplace that gave workers some kind of voice and participation in decision making. Some of them also practiced profit sharing. The goal of many was probably union avoidance, but they also did succeed in giving workers a voice and some participation role. During the Great War, once America ended, uh, entered the war, remember on the theme of making the world safe for democracy, um, there were a number of labor disputes, big strikes, and the government set up agencies to try to resolve these labor conflicts. A result of these labor agencies was the creation of collective bargaining between workers and employers through committees, shop committees, works councils. Most of them were non-union forms of, of work council or, or committee, but they were supervised by these government agencies. And America came out of the war with great hopes that this was going to finally introduce industrial democracy in the form of collective bargaining. Well, it wasn't quite to happen that way at that time. There was a huge right-wing reaction after the war. America retreated to isolationism. There were forces of reaction. Uh, the labor movement itself was divided in terms of their goals. And employers seized the moment to establish a form of non-union collective bargaining. Uh, mostly, these have been called company unions. It's also been called welfare capitalism. They, they coupled these committees with various kinds of benefits in an effort to keep workers happy. Although 
trade unionists were disappointed by the decline of what they saw possible at the end of the war, things still had changed. They had not gone back to the complete workplace autocracy that had existed before. Certainly, the wartime experience, and particularly the role of the government, was to play a major part in the development of the collective bargaining system that ultimately arose in the United States during the New Deal. But it wasn't a foregone conclusion in 1919. And between 1919 and 1935, when the National Labor Relations Act was enacted, there, were a there was a great amount of experimentation and battle lines were drawn over what form industrial democracy would take. And it wasn't until the New Deal and the economic crisis of the, of the Great Depression that the United States landed on this notion of collective bargaining as the form of industrial democracy that it would pursue. Congress passed the, the law in 1935. It created an administrative agency to enforce the protections of the right to unionize and bargain collectively. This agency supplanted judge-made law, especially the labor injunction, uh, with a system of state-supervised collective bargaining. And it combined goals of both economic and political liberty. The explicit aim of this law was to promote recovery from the Great Depression by equalizing bargaining power between labor and capital. The notion was that through collective bargaining with employers, workers would increase their incomes and thereby their purchasing power and thereby restore the nation to prosperity. A key promise of this law, though, beyond raising wages, was to promote a system of industrial democracy for all employees. Through collective bargaining with their employers, through independent trade unions, employees would have a voice and effective representation, and they would find freedom from the auto autocratic control of employers. The Act, the National Labor Relations Act, was also said to be an intellectual revolution in the sense that it challenged the reigning judicial construct that the relationship between workers and their employers was one of freedom or liberty of contract. And what the law says quite explicitly is that actual liberty of contract can occur only through an equalizing of bargaining power. When this collective bargaining model of industrial, uh, industrial democracy became established, the other earlier models of industrial democracy pretty much vanished. Worker ownership efforts faded and dropped out of the public discourse, and employer-sponsored employee participation plans that had flourished during the 1920s were outlawed by the statute. The, 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 the prime sponsor of the statute, Senator Robert Wagner from New York, believed that you could only have real collective bargaining if trade unions were independent of employers. And that would be that these company unions were a real obstacle to collective bargaining. Unquestionably, the law generated enormous optimism at the beginning, and it worked for a while. Millions of people voted in elections conducted by the government agency. Millions of people achieved collective bargaining agreements, which gave them improved wages. People entered the middle class as a result of these collective bargaining agreements. And for some years, workers and management effectively shared the wealth produced by the growth in productivity. And the collective bargaining system contributed to the widely shared prosperity that existed after the Second World War for several decades. But as early as the late 1970s, early 1980s, commentators were beginning to despair. Terms like America's unfulfilled promise or an elegant tombstone for a dying institution. And some have said that by the time that Franklin Roosevelt died in 1945, the notion of the labor question had already been eclipsed, losing what's been called the, the, its moral preeminence, its political threat, and its elemental social significance. Instead of the labor question, what was substituted was 
reaching the American standard of living. The labor relations law was amended significantly in 1947 at the end of the Second World War. All of the amendments were adverse to employee protections and collective bargainings and collective bargaining. Since then, there have been several attempts to update or modernize the law, and every one of those attempts has ended in legislative gridlock. The election of Barack Obama was the last time when there were great hopes, great fears by the business community, that labor law would finally be revitalized, but that was not to be either. The law has been insulated from change for decades, notwithstanding dramatic transformations in our economy and in the realities of the workplace. There are lots of reasons why the law has been so impervious to change. A big one, in my view, is that there's never really been consensus in our society about the legitimacy of this law, or about the legitimacy of labor unions, for that matter. There's also a very long institutionalized history of anti-unionism in the United States. Unions remain under legal and political attack. The decisions of the National Labor Relations Board are under critical review by the courts of appeals. And so there is really no consensus that exists for how to update the law. Some would eliminate it, some would strengthen its worker provisions. So, what we have today, more than 80 years after its enactment, more than 100 years after the nation debated the labor question, what we have really is what some would say is a failed system. There are uh, few employer mandates that exist outside of the collective bargaining system. So what we have is a very weak, outdated legal regime that, govern, that governs the, the workplace. And the labor law itself remains a political lightning rod. It is impossible in the US to talk about labor law divorced from our very polarized po uh, politics. So today, where are we? At this very difficult historical moment, I think it's fair to say that the labor question has reemerged in America. The post-war social contract has come undone. Wages have stagnated for decades. Inequality has risen to levels not seen since the Gilded Age. Union density in the private sector has eroded. It is less than 7% today. Corporate influence and the influence of Wall Street has increased enormously. It is unchecked by regulation, by trade unions, or by worker power. Social tensions abound of all types, as do fears that technology will eat our jobs and that the American dream has come to an end. Democratic institutions are under stress. That's the negative story. But against all of these threats, there are echoes today, in my view, of the intellectual and activist ferment of 100 years ago. Older ideas about industrial democracy are being reimagined, and new strategies are being explored. I think we are witnessing a dynamism of both thought and action not seen in decades. <clears throat> Traditional collective bargaining has faltered. There is no question about that. And the vast number of workers in the United States are employed at will without the protections of collective bargaining. But collective bargaining has most certainly not been abandoned. It's not dead yet. And it is still viewed as an optimum way to give workers a voice at work and bargaining power. Many within organized labor and other worker advocates are debating how unions and collective bargaining can be revitalized. The AFL-CIO has established its own Future of Work Commission. Earlier forms of industrial democracy are also being revisited. Co-determination is gaining increased attention, particularly the German model with its establishment level works councils and corporate board level worker representation. While there is still no consensus on the wisdom of the original prohibitions on alternative forms of worker representation, there are strong views that those prohibitions have sorely and unnecessarily limited the types of representation 
that workers could enjoy in the workplace, particularly in a society where today fewer than 7% enjoy collective bargaining. Several years ago, Volkswagen uh, attracted a lot of attention when it entered into an agreement with the United Auto Workers that if the auto workers would succeed in organizing the plant in Tennessee, they would negotiate to create a workplace level works council. And this was widely viewed as a great possibility in the United States to revitalize labor management relations, particularly in the South, which has been historically anti-union. Well, it didn't, didn't happen the way it was hoped because the United Auto Workers narrowly lost the election. And so this Works Council hasn't, hasn't happened yet. But still, the subject has entered public discourse. And very recently, two bills were introduced into the US Senate by two Democratic senators, which would call for reforms to corporate governance and require worker representation on corporate boards, one bill two-fifths and one bill, one-third. In addition, the notion of worker ownership or shared capitalism has been revived in recent years. It's being pursued in different forms, from worker cooperatives to employee stock ownership plans to <coughs> profit sharing plans. Each of these has separate legal structures, um, but there are growing number of experiments, still small, but growing number, uh, and they firms embark on shared ownership for different reasons. Some have a deep ideological commitment to workplace democracy, and so with the ownership comes a governance role. Some just see it as a way to provide employees a short-term financial stake, and some see it as a part of an overall broader human resource strategy as to how to provide competitive benefits. Unions are skeptical, some are interested, so far, the interest of unions is limited, but it, it, I think it's, it's growing. Uh, and there are some scholars who believe that worker ownership or a more inclusive kind of capitalism is a critical step to solving the challenge of inequality and saving the middle class in our country. So those are revisiting old forms of industrial democracy. But a lot of creative experimentation is also underway with new forms of worker voice and power. And collective action by workers is clearly on the rise, much of it driven by social media. So from the fight for 15, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, and striking teachers in six red conservative states last year, there is definitely evidence of workers mobilizing. More people were on strike last year than at any time in the last 30 years. The fight for 15 is, of course, has become a global movement. It started with fast food workers, has now spread to other low wage workers, seeking $15 an hour minimum wage and a union. While they have not yet succeeded in achieving a union, they have achieved minimum wage increases in in states all over the country and cities all over the country. In addition, workers who are excluded from the basic labor laws coverage, such as public sector employees, domestic workers, those treated as independent contractors like Uber drivers and other platform workers, they're mobilizing uh, without the protection of labor law. Some are joining traditional unions, some are creating their own organizations, some are aligning with other alternative advocacy groups. And they're experimenting with all different kinds of approaches, again, relying on social media. And amazingly, this is also happening in the Silicon Valley. Starting probably with Uber, when a Uber, Uber engineer, Susan Fowler, uh, went, uh, when a blog post of hers went viral complaining about uh, systemic sexual harassment at Uber, got world, wa worldwide attention, forcing the then CEO, Travis Kalanick, to step down. And Google workers, in particular, have been testing their unique leverage against Google. They've organized a string of protests over workplace issues, such as sexual harassment, treatment of women, and, a, and diversity. But interestingly, they've also tackled some very controversial business contracts that Google has. 
a Project Maven is something they protested and got Google to back away from. It was a project, a contract with the Pentagon to analyze drone video, videos. Uh, and then they went after another project called Project Dragonfly, which is a project to develop a uh, censored search engine in, in China. And last fall, 20,000 Google employees walked off the job worldwide. They had five demands, one of which was worker representation on the corporate board. A second was ending the forced arbitration policy. They succeeded in that one, and they are continuing their efforts. Uh, political scientists are also becoming aware of issues of workplace autocracy, the private government at work. Uh, some are looking back to the Knights of Labor and the, the labor Republicans of the 19th century for solutions. So it's too early to know the viability of all these efforts, and we cannot discount business opposition and right-wing opposition in the United States. That's a constant. But right now, these efforts remain alive. They could provide a laboratory for testing a new social contract for the 21st century, and they could perhaps foretell the next big idea comparable to industrial democracy of, of the last century. Hopefully, going forward, the approach to industrial democracy would embrace multifaceted approaches without rigidly locking into one system or structure, all of which I think would be fitting for a very large and very complex political economy like the US. Many thanks, dear Wilma, for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I would ask, uh, do you need a short translation or summary, or everything is clear for you? <laughs> Est-ce que vous souhaitez que je fasse un très court résumé? <laughs> bon. bon, très très brièvement. Um, I, I may I just give a, yeah. a very short summary. Uh, Wilma nous a euh, retracé, euh, au fond, l'histoire euh, des droits du travail, des relations de travail depuis le traité de Versailles euh, euh, signé en, à Paris en 1919, où le président Wilson avait joué un rôle d'impulsion euh, très important, euh, visant à traduire ce qui avait été des, des revendications, euh, même avant-guerre, sur euh, la les promesses démocratiques. En fait, le problème de base qui était commun, d'ailleurs, avec notre pays, c'est la contradiction latente qu'il y a entre la, la, la promesse de démocratie politique et l'absence de toute démocratie dans le monde industriel. Et face à ce euh, dilemme, euh, deux courants se sont euh, opposés, aux États-Unis comme d'ailleurs en France, euh, ceux qui voyaient une issue dans une propriété par les travailleurs eux-mêmes de l'outil de travail, je pense en France aux expériences de Proudhon, mais qui avaient leur équivalent à l'époque aux États-Unis, chez les chevaliers du travail, par exemple, au XIXe siècle. Et puis un autre courant plaidait plutôt pour une démocratisation par la négociation collective, c'était le cas notamment de la grande figure syndicale américaine de Gumpers, et c'est ce courant qui l'a emporté, euh, alors, je, je passe, parce que Wilma nous a un peu expliqué la période des années 20, avant le, le New Deal, mais ce sont ces idées qui ont nourri euh, l'adoption en 1935 donc de, de la grande loi sur les relations de travail et de la création du, du, du bureau national, de l'Agence nationale sur les relations euh, de, de travail, euh, avec un effacement progressif des idées d'autogestion ou de contrôle ouvrier ou de coopérative qui avait été très vivace dans les périodes précédentes. Alors, c'est sur cette base que développé, se sont développés ce qu'on appelle en France les, les, 30, les 30 glorieuses, et qui ont vu en même temps un, un certain effacement de la question, de la de labor question, au profit de la question qui devient centrale, qui est la question du niveau de vie euh, et de la rémunération. Euh, ce qui fait que progressivement, le, le système juridique du droit du travail américain s'est euh, isolé, ne s'est pas adapté au changement et sa légitimité euh, n'a jamais été euh, politiquement très assurée. Elle a toujours été euh, contestée. Euh, 
uh, there are some legal reasons for that, I believe, that uh, um, a specificity of the American experience was not to have a constitutional basis. It, it was, you, you had a debate about the choice of the, this basis before the Second World War, and it's a big difference with France, for example, yes. where we have the preambule of the... So, uh, uh, and now, oui, alors maintenant, pour en venir à la période... De, Pour, pour en venir à la période actuelle, euh, on y voit ressurgir la question sociale avec la croissance des, des, des inégalités, la fin du rêve américain. On peut attribuer à ces événements aussi euh, le climat de, de démocratie politique dégradée qui est celui des États-Unis actuellement. Mais face à euh, toutes ces menaces, Wilma nous a aussi donné les signes d'espoir qu'il y a dans de nouvelles formes de mobilisation La négociation collective n'est pas tout à fait morte, même si j'ai bien compris, maintenant, c'est 7% de la population salariale qui est couverte par des accords collectifs, c'est-à-dire que pour le reste, c'est du euh, « work at will euh, », donc sans protection euh, par une couverture conventionnelle. Et on voit arriver de nouvelles formes de représentation euh, collective, de, soit des « work council », soit de la représentation dans les « corporate boards dans, », dans les conseils d'administration, Euh, et elle nous a donné aussi l'exemple de, de la grève chez, et des mouvements sociaux, notamment chez Google, avec comme euh, revendication euh, des, de, une représentation des travailleurs dans l'entreprise. Et euh, aussi, je le note, parce que c'est quelque chose dont j'aurai l'occasion de parler, je pense, dans les quelques cours que je ferai à partir de la fin mars, parce que c'est un point à mes yeux très intéressant important, une contestation par les travailleurs américains de l'éviction de la figure, de la possibilité de saisir le juge par l'inscription systématique de clauses d'arbitrage dans les contrats de travail qui privent de facto les salariés de la possibilité de s'adresser au juge. Or, s'adresser au juge dans le système américain, c'était un moyen de suppléer euh, l'absence de couverture conventionnelle, parce que vous, devez, vous pouvez aller devant le juge en narguant au moins des droits fondamentaux. Si vous avez signé une clause d'arbitrage, vous ne pouvez même plus faire cela. Et donc, il y a, euh, et c'est un, alors en France, on n'est pas allé jusque-là, mais la multiplication des barrières pour empêcher l'accès au juge de la part des salariés, euh, cette façon, ça m'a beaucoup intéressé de voir, c'était une des revendications qui avait été avancée à Google. Donc, on peut voir les États-Unis aujourd'hui, c'était la conclusion de Wilma, comme une sorte de laboratoire aussi, euh, où pourraient surgir des formes, des formes nouvelles. Uh, I hope not to, uh, I hope to, you, you could trust my translation, more or less. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was Sounds not good. A so easy an exercise.